bottom of exactly why far-right terrorism is on the rise. And I can't help but feel as though wrongly, obviously, but the answer is staring us in the face. And I want to kind of get in amongst that a bit, really. It emerges that MI5 is, of course, working round the clock. And thankfully, very thankfully for us, we don't hear about the vast majority of the ones and the attacks that they thwart from both Islamists and the far right. But joining me now is social policy analyst Rakib Hassan. Uh, and I believe, yes, there we are, Major General Chip Chapman, former head of counterterrorism at the Ministry of Defence. Rakib, can I just ask you a little bit about... Uh, I'm very keen to make sure I get the tone of this right, because for not one second am I trying to excuse, I would never dream of it, you know, the rise of far-right terrorism. But when you look at maybe the way that the government is not getting to grips with things like national security, whether it's in the channel, whether or not people feel as though you know, the country is changing around them, whether they're seeing these migrant hotels popping up left, right and centre, I can't help but feel as though that is playing into the hands of people who, well, uh, uh, lend themselves towards far-right terrorism. Your views, Ricky? Well, Patrick, I authored a piece for CapEx very recently where I advanced the view that these, what we're seeing in Britain, the perfect conditions for the rise of extreme uh, right, uh, right-wing activity. Uh, what we're seeing is the country uh, contending with a border security crisis, uh, relatively high le levels of illegal immigration, and that does pose uh, a, a security problem, especially when you hear uh, migrants uh, being housed in under-supervised, unregulated forms of accom accommodation and then absconding. That that is a serious security issue, and then when you're looking at the amount of money which is being spent uh, on this particular crisis, especially the housing, uh, housing illegal migrants in the middle of a cost of living crisis, I, I would make the point that you are, the, the combination of economic and cultural yeah, anxieties absolutely. may well be fueling a rise in extreme right wing activity in Britain. Yeah, and I think you've hit the nail on the head there. It is that potent combination, that kind of Molotov cocktail of disaster, really, which is which is that. Major General Chip Chapman, I'll bring you in now. I, I am seriously concerned that we are sitting on a powder keg as a country. We've got huge numbers, you're popular, we've got huge numbers of people in the in the Islamist, radical Islamist sect, and an increasing number of the far right. And, I mean, let's be honest, at some point that appears as though it's going to come together, and that's not going to be great, is it, Major General? Well, if you look at how we look at these things, we look at what you said previously, Patrick, in three ways. So firstly, we look at what we call cultural nationalists on the right wing extremist side. The second one is white supremacists or white nationalists. And the third one is identitarian, those who see that we're le leading to an inevitable race war. So that's the way that right wing extremism is looked at by the security community. Um, whether that was all true, I think that we have to be careful of the dread hazard and threat inflation because the high point the, of terrorism is kind of over. There aren't that many people who are arrested each year. Most people who are arrested for terrorism uh, do less than four years. So we have to be slightly careful how we look at the figures. And so people like me, for example, would uh, tell you that uh, we have to be you know, use evidence-based analysis when we're looking at these things. Mm. And of course, there is gonna be a contest refresh in the next year, that is the counter-terrorist strategy. The part which is missing, which you've alluded to, the counter strategy includes prevent, prepare, protect and pursue. It's the promotion of community cohesion, which is possibly been missing, the fifth missing P, and has been from 20 years. There have been some very, very good reports, but very little done in terms of the recommendations and seeing action. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Rakib, I'll throw it back over to you. Rakib Hassan, I can't help but feel this is, as we've been alluding to here now, just a really potent combination of all these different factors that potentially are about to come together in some kind of perfect storm. We've had uh, huge societal changes in the UK, huge demographic changes. Integration has not necessarily worked too well in a lot of cases. We've then seen, you know, a slowdown of our economy. We're also seeing, you know, importation of people across the channel and extreme views. The Internet exacerbates all of this. But one issue I'm keen to get you on now is actually, are we too soft on terrorists in general? We see the likes of Anjem Chowdhury could not be more overt in their, in their terrorist desires. Uh, back out about and about on the streets of Britain. We're not exactly clamping down on them too hard, are we? Well, Pat oh, 
be careful when they're talking about uh, potentially authoritarian uh, responses. Uh, I remember that in the Tory leadership contest that Liz Truss won, that Rishi Sunak suggested that um, those who uh, express uh, forms of hatred against Britain uh, could, could be referred to prevent. Uh, that, that, that there could be all kinds of flexible interpretations involved in that. And I think that w one of the key points that I would like to make is that we have to protect our own liberal democratic values and they can't be sacrificed in anti-terrorism efforts. Uh, I think my fellow guest makes a fantastic point my background being in social integration. I think that community cohesion component um, is missing from our broader counter-extremism strategies. Uh, there are some people who have said that while our counter-terrorism efforts are fairly robust and effective, it, it, when it comes to counter-extremism, there's a great deal of work that needs to be done. Patrick, you've talked uh, uh, many times before about uh, the existence of parallel communities, yeah. um, social segregation, and how that impacts um, on levels of social trust between different groups. And the reality is if you have different um, ethnic and religious group, groups living side by side but not having that positive interaction, then that's a, that, that, that's a gift for extremist actors to uh, capitalise on those suspicions of the unknown.